Good evening and welcome. Wow. That got your attention. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Really so good to see so many people coming to, uh, to listen to, um, to the truth as we believe it to be from both sides. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of uh, Auburn Presbyterian Church, we welcome you. And we're so happy to have you. And uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, afterwards, please come and join us for a bit of uh, supper, tea and coffee and some nibbles, so we can get to know each other a bit more. I uh, love the idea of debates in, uh, in good uh, faith uh, as we present the, the truth as we believe it. And it's up to everyone to make up their own minds, of course. And I'll leave now the mic to the moderator, uh, Pastor Andy Chung, and uh, of course we welcome the, uh, uh, the speakers, both Samuel and Abdullah, and uh, we uh, bless you all in Jesus' name. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Andy Chung. I'm the pastor at Barella Anglican Church, St. James Barella. I will be your MC tonight which means that I am here to make sure everyone does the right thing. <laughs> Firstly, Samuel. Secondly, Abdullah. And all of you too. <laughs> so let me say three things before I tell you some important things. One, toilets. If you want to find a toilet, you go out the back door, down the corridor, back in the door, and then follow the signs. Follow the two, three signs, and then you'll get there. Secondly, Please turn your mobile phones off or on silent or airplane mode because we do not want interruptions. Thirdly, the event tonight is being recorded on video and it will appear on the internet and on DVD. And so this is a public event and it's being filmed for use in the public media which means that if you are here tonight, then you agree and consent to being part of the video if the camera happens to see you. And so if you do not agree to that, you can um, quietly leave now or hide in the corner. <laughs> well, those three preliminary things out of the way, let me introduce you to the speakers. Samuel Green and Abdullah Kundi. They've debated together several times before, so they know each other. Some of us know one or the other of them. Some of us do not know them. Abdullah is a medical student in his fourth year of medical studies with a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science degree before that. He's the founding member of the Muslim Debate Initiative, and he's been engaging in these debates for a, a little while. Samuel works for the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students, which is a university group of Christian students around Australia. His particular focus is talking to Muslims about Jesus because of his experience and knowledge in this area. So what are we doing tonight? We're here for a debate, the preservation of the Bible and the Quran. What is the Bible and the Quran? This Bible and this Quran we have in front of us, what are they? And when we look at this Bible and this Quran, can we trust what we're reading? How reliable and accurate are these two scriptures to tell us about God? And how do we know that? What's the oldest manuscript for the Bible and the Quran? And do our books today go back to those 
oldest manuscripts. There's some big questions we're looking at tonight. But as we listen to this debate, we are doing something even bigger, even more important. We are all here to seek truth. Is that not right? You see, I want to start with the common ground. Uh, the debate might get very interesting, very strong, heated, but there's one common ground. We all believe in one God, one Allah. Who is that God? We want the truth. So we, we remember that in friendship and honesty and kindness because we both want the truth. So let me tell you the format of tonight. Each speaker will have 25 minutes to present, then each will have 10 minutes to reply, and then a further four minutes to reply. After that, there will be 10 minutes each for questions, particularly written questions. So you have opportunity from now throughout the night to write down your questions and our ushers will collect your questions. If you're well behaved, we might take some questions from the floor. I have a stopwatch and a bell, and I will begin timing from the speaker's first word, and then I'll ring the bell one minute before the end of their time. If they continue after that time, then that time that they extend will be deducted from their later slots. There will also be no interruptions. You will have opportunity to ask your questions. But if there are interruptions, then I will ask the speaker to sit down and I will wait till the interruption stops and then I will start the clock again. Samuel will speak first and then Abdullah will speak next. That's all I have to say. Let us please welcome Samuel to the stand. Well, good evening, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. My prayer for tonight has been that God will bless our time together and that we will listen to each other, consider the other person's point of view, and that we will all come away with a better understanding of this subject. I'd also like to thank Abdullah Kundi for being part of this debate tonight. And I'd like to thank all of you here for taking these matters seriously and for taking the matters of God seriously and wanting, as Andy said, to, to be seeking the truth in this regard. The topic tonight is the preservation of the Bible and the Quran. Now, you may be asking why discuss this topic. Well, it's because it's a topic that nearly always comes up when Christians and Muslims talk to each other about God. When Christians and Muslims talk to each other about God, it's common for the Muslim to say, the Bible is corrupted and the Quran is perfectly preserved. We see this in these types of publications here. And everyone should have notes that they were given, so it's on the PowerPoint, but also in your handouts. Point A, no other book in the world can match the Quran. The astonishing fact about this book of Allah is that it has remained unchanged, even to a dot over the last 1,400 years. No variation of text can be found in it. But of the Bible, the Islamic teachers will say, the books that are in the hands of the people of the book, that is Christians and Jews today, should not be viewed as authentic because they have been distorted, altered and tampered with. And so in summary, and uh, I'm just talking now from these quotes, but also generally, this is what Muslims say to Christians, that there is only one Quran, that it has no variations, that all Qurans around the world are identical, and that every word is certain, that it is perfectly preserved, uh, but the Bible has been corrupted. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters for a few reasons. Firstly, because it stops Muslims listening to Christians. When a Christian quotes something from the Bible, the Muslim can very easily just dismiss it because they say, well, it's corrupted, I don't need to listen to that. And the result is that Christians and Muslims don't talk and have dialogue. Secondly, many Christians and Muslims are not actually aware of what evidence there is for their books. Very often we can just assume that our books are right because we've just had them. And so it's important that we consider this subject 
so that when these issues are raised of if the Bible's corrupted or not, we know how to respond to this. And finally, from the Christian point of view, when Muslims are saying the Bible is, corru the Bible is corrupted, we see them as turning people away from reading the prophets of God. And so we see that as a very serious thing. And so you need to have some good evidence if you're going to say, don't read the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. In my presentation tonight, I want to look at three areas. First of all, the, pres the preservation of the Bible. Secondly, the preservation of the Quran. And finally, what does the Quran say about the Bible? And I say this at the start of all my debates, that this may be a hard matter for you to listen to. Abdullah may have some hard things to say to the Christians tonight. I may have some hard things to say to the Muslims. Please let Abdullah and I answer for each other, and, and then you'll have your chance in the question time. Well, let's look at the first one, the preservation of the Bible. The first point I want to bring up to show that the Bible has been preserved is for us to look at how the message of the Bible has been preserved. Now, why do I say that? Well, you see, the Bible is not one book. Please have a look at the table in your notes about the Bible there, and you'll see that the Bible is actually a collection of many prophets over about a 1,500-year period. There's the Torah, the Law of Moses, the Books of the Prophets, the Psalms, and the Books of the Gospel. And throughout this 1,500-year period, across many different languages and across different cultures, we find this one message being taught. We see that humanity is created in the image of God. We learn about the fatherhood of God in all these prophets. We learn about the son of God in these prophets. We learn that God dwells with his people in these prophets. We learn that God accepts a sacrifice for sin and that God is faithful to the same covenants throughout this whole period of time. And so we see this one unchanged message all the way through the prophets from different times, cultures, and languages. And this is a testimony that it hasn't changed because it's different times, different locations, different prophets, all with the one message. And this is one of the testimonies to the, 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 to the fact that this message hasn't changed, that it has remained one message. Secondly, I want us to consider the text of the Bible. And I'll spend a bit more time at this point. First thing I want to say here is that the books of the Bible were meant to be preserved. So at point C in your notes, you'll see from the Torah, Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried, carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And so Moses actually wrote it down and gave it to the priests. And God's people have always had this teaching role among them where the scriptures have been passed down and taught. It was the same with Jesus' disciples when he sent them out. We see that they used writing as part of the way that they taught people. In fact, at point D, you'll see there uh, one of the apostles of Jesus speaking, and he says, After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. And so here within the, the ministry of the apostles of Jesus, we see that the the passing of scripture from one person to the other, one church to another, and the copying of scripture was there right from the beginning. And what we actually find is that the early church used the writing of the, of the apostles along with the earlier prophets from the Jewish period. They used these in part of their church service. And so from the, the beginning, they're, they're reading the scriptures, commenting on them, writing commentaries about them. Now, what evidence do we have that that these books have been preserved. Okay, they may have been written, they may have been passed to the churches. What evidence do we have that they've been preserved? There's three main evidences that scholars consider. First is, the first is that of the manuscripts themselves. What ancient manuscripts do we have and what do they tell us? When it comes to the Bible, we've got the, the Jewish prophets from the Dead Sea Scrolls from before the time of Jesus. And then we've got early translations from about the year 300 BC. With the New Testament, we've got early copies from about well, within, a, within, within 100 years of Jesus' life with fragments, and then complete copies building up over that time. And there's around 5,000 uh, ancient copies that we've got. We've also got ancient translations that we can look at. 
And the translations testify to what the text was at a very early period because the translation was made from that text. And then, of course, we've got quotes made by early scholars. So the early Christians had their theologians, just as the early Muslims did, and, and, and they're quoting from the scriptures. And so scholars look at the manuscripts, the ancient translations, and the early scholars' quotes. It's actually a lot of inf information we've got here. When it comes to the, new, the, the Bible and the New Testament, we've actually got a lot of information to consider. Now, what does this show? Well, it actually shows that the Bible has been very well preserved. We can actually track the books from an early period of time over a long period of time and look back at that early period of time. There are small differences between them, often in the spelling of words or sometimes in the word order. Sometimes these reflect uh, particular regional spellings. Sometimes you'll see scholars say things like, oh, there are 50,000 errors in the Bible, and you'll get those types of quotes used by people. Some people like Ahmed Dadat will give those types of quotes. But please have a look at point E of your notes there, and you'll see that when you get those numbers of 50,000 or 200,000 errors, which people often quote, we need to realise this. Point E, if one single word is misspelled in 3,000 different manuscripts, it is counted as 3,000 variants or readings. Once these counting procedures have been understood, the mechanical orth uh, orthographic variants have been eliminated, the remaining significant variants are surprisingly few in number. So when we're quoting textbooks which give us numbers about things with the text of the New Testament, we need to make sure we understand what we're quoting. There are some bigger ones, not many, but a few. The end of Mark's Gospel, has 11 verses, uh, which uh, Christians will raise questions over. And in John chapter 8, there's another 11 verses there. But they're the only big sections. These are the exceptions. The normal rule is that it has been very well preserved. Now, are these small differences a problem? They're not a problem because of the way that the text went out to different areas. You can see here that I've got a diagram there, and it's in your notes as well, that a book is made, and then copies are made, and those copies spread out over different regions. And then as, the, as those books are copied in different regions, different families of copies are made. And what you can see is, if you look up there, even if a, a mistake is made on strand A over there, it only affects all the books that are made in strand A. It doesn't affect any others. And so what scholars do is they get these books from a wide, ranging, wide region and they just systematically compare them. And if there has been an error in transmission, they can normally spot it in one of the families and they can say it's in this family, but it's not in this one, this one or this one. Therefore, we can see there's been an error in transmission. And, uh, and so they can make the appropriate uh, correction and realise that that's what it is. This is why uh, it's from work like this with the modern discovery of some of these ancient documents that, uh, that they made new translations of the Bible over and above the King James translation. Because the King James translation was made on later manuscripts, and when they found some earlier ones, they said, we need to update this, and so that's what they did. Bruce Metzger, who's one of the famous scholars in this area, he said in point F, we can have great confidence in the fidelity with which the material has come down to us, especially compared to any other ancient literary work. And so we've actually got lots of material to consider for the Bible, and it shows that it's been well preserved over this time. And so to conclude that first section, I just want to say that when Muslim leaders say the Bible has been corrupted, that's not the case. There is the evidence of the one message throughout 1,500 years of prophets which testify to its preservation, and then there's the fact that we've got many manuscripts from spread apart and we can actually see that it's been well preserved and any error in copying can be easily identified. Let me move on to point two now, the preservation of the Quran. So what we're told about the Quran, again by the Muslim leaders, is that there's one Quran perfectly preserved, no variance, and every word is certain. And sometimes I'll say it's been memorised by thousands of people. Uh, maybe you've said something like that. Uh, certainly I've heard that, and we were at the mosque recently, uh, just the other day, and that's what the, the, uh, the leader of the mosque, the, the, our guide at the mosque, was telling us about the Bible and about the Quran. Now, I want to show you from the common Islamic history and from, and from the Qurans around the world that this claim about the Quran is just not true. 
The Hadith is very clear that Muhammad never made a final collection of the Quran, but it was his companions. We're told that they memorized the Quran, yes, but they memorized it differently. Please have a look at point H on your notes. Narrated Ibrahim, the companions of Abdullah ibn Masud came to Abu Dada, and before they arrived at his home, he looked for them and found them. Then he asked them, who among you can recite the Quran as Abdullah recites it? They replied, all of us. He asked, who among you knows it by heart? They pointed to al -Kama. Then he asked al -Kama, how did you hear Abdullah ibn Masud reciting Surat al late the night? al -Kama recited, by the male and the female. Abu Dada said, I testify that I heard the prophet reciting it likewise, but these people want me to recite it by him who created male and female, but by Allah I will not follow them. So you can see here's two different groups of Muslims arguing over how this verse was memorised and should be recited. Now these differences here, you can see they're not dialects. These d differences led to actually different collections of the Quran by different uh, uh, disciples or companions of Muhammad. And this was actually an early subject of Islamic scholarship. So the Arabic librarian, Ibn Abi Yaqub al-Nadim, made a famous catalogue of all the books in Arabic in the fourth Islamic century. And at point I, you can see he's actually got a whole catalogue of the Arabic books. And you can see at point I, they're composed about the discrepancies of the Quranic manuscripts. And so this comparing of the different regional Qurans was an area of early Islamic uh, study. Now, th these differences between them uh, were in the following way. They had different numbers of surahs. Some of them had 111 surahs, some 116. Some of them had different surah orders. And I've given you a reference if you wanted to follow that through, because I've actually discovered some of these with the different orders recently. They also had different words, which we've already looked at in the previous hadith. Some Muslims will say that these collections were just for private use. Uh, and that they weren't for public use. But as we saw from that hadith, they were for public use because that's why the disciples were arguing with each other. Now, this, this led to a, a problem for the, early, uh, for, for the early caliph. And so we read at point L that Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of the Quran that he had copied and he ordered that all other Quranic materials whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. And so this situation was rectified by Uthman, the third Islamic caliph, standardising one Quran and ordering the burning of the rest. Now, we're actually told that Abdullah ibn Masud and others didn't accept this. And there, there are quite a few hadiths where it speaks about Abdullah refusing to give up his Quran. So I've given you one there. Abdullah ibn Masud reported that he said to his companions to conceal their copies of the Quran, and uh, there's, there's three references to that. So therefore, the history of Islam shows that there were multiple versions, still quite similar, don't get me wrong. I, I think they were quite similar, but with small differences between them and that one text was standardized through a wholesale burning. What about the Qurans that are in the world today? Well, we're often told, as, as I read out in that first quote, that they're all identical, but this is just not the case. I've got a few Qurans here, and they're not the same. Let me just get down to here. You actually can't just simply read the Quran. You have to read it according to a famous Arabic reciter. And you, the, the, there are four common ones, the Quran according to Imam Hafs, according to Imam Wash, Imam Kaloun, and Imam al duri And so I've got two of them here. Uh, this is the Quran according to Imam Wash, and this is the, the standard one you would get in Australia according to Imam Hafs. Now, there are differences between them. So let's have a look at some of these differences. Again, they're not enormous differences, but in the Wash version, it will say, Kul Rabi Ya'ilamu, which is, say, my Lord knows. So that, that, that's God giving a command to the Muslim. In the Hafs version, it says, Kala Rabi Ya'ilamu, which is, he said, my Lord knows. And so the subject there is Muhammad. So in the first one, it's God giving a command in the imperative. In the second, it's the indicative of something Muhammad said. So it changes the subject of the sentence. Or here, it's uh, katila, so many a prophet fought, 
or in the Walsh version, uh, Kutila, uh, many a prophet was killed. So one's the active and one's the passive. Now again, I don't want to exaggerate those. I don't think it corrupts the overall meaning of the Quran. That would be a ridiculous thing to say. But what I am saying is that these are not dialects and there are small differences between them. Now you can actually get Qurans, and again, I just, just buy these things off the internet, but you can actually get Qurans which have the differences between the 10 major versions all listed in the margin. And there's thousands of them, right? Thousands of differences. Between these two Qurans, there's uh, 1,354 differences between those two. Again, I'm not trying to say it's corrupted, but I'm just saying there are these small differences there. Another difference between these two Qurans is actually the Basmala. You know, the, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. The, uh, sorry, I may have got the order wrong slightly there. It's the first four words at the start of each surah, except surah 9. Now, in this Quran, according to Imam Hafs, that's part of the revelation, those first four words. But according to Imam Warsh, it's not part of the revelation. It's just part of the title. So you see that at point N in your notes. Uh, the, the readers themselves differ over whether the Basmala was a verse in Surah Al-Fatiha and the other surahs. Among the Qaris, the readers, Ibn Kathir, Asim and al kasir were the only ones who considered it to be a verse at the beginning of the surah, where the others did not. So in other words, the majority view of the early reciters is that that is not part of the revelation, and the minority view is that it is, and that, that the Quran we use in Australia actually follows the minority view. Now, the, that, that Basmala appears 113 times and has four words. So that's actually 452 words where the scholars dis disagree as to whether or not it's part of the revelation. Now, does it make an enormous difference to the meaning of the Quran? No, and I'm not trying to exaggerate and say it does. But what I am saying is, it, you can't say every word is certain when your own uh, scholars say they have different views on this. So the evidence that we have is, uh, from when we consider the, the different Qurans that are used around the world today, we can see that there are different versions uh, with a small variance between them. Now, I've met some Muslims who will say, yes, that's the case, and we accept that there are these, there were the early different collections and there are the, 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 these different uh, readings of the Qurans or the, these different Qurans here. But what they'll say is that there is a chain of narration which guarantees this Quran. So even if this one does have differences to the other Qurans, the, the chain of narration guarantees that it goes back. Now, what do I mean by the chain of narration? It's the, it's the list of names back to the, the prophet. So the, the Quran is like the Hadith in that it has a, a chain of narration. So the, there's the, the, the material and then there's a chain guaranteeing its, its transmission back to the apostle. But I just want to show you the, the, tra the chain of narration for, for the Hafs Quran that we use. You'll see on the bottom right that Abdullah ibn Masud is one of the links in that chain. Now, there is ample evidence to show that Abdullah ibn Masud did not accept Uthman's recension. And when it comes to uh, studying of the Isnads, it, it's got to be a complete chain. They have to be reliable people in the chain, but it also has to be historically possible. And I, I'm tell, I, what I'm putting forward here is that the Islamic evidence that I've read in all the main hadith is that Abdullah ibn Masud and several sources did not accept the Uthman Quran. And so I don't accept this as being a, a, a sahith chain, but a, a da'if chain. To conclude, Muslim leaders claim that there's only one Quran and that there are no variants. It's perfectly preserved. But there's no evidence for this. I think that the Quran has been well preserved, but the claim Muslim leaders make are simply false. I now want to finish up with my last few minutes looking at what does the Quran say about the Bible? Because some Muslims have said to me that the Quran says that the Bible is corrupt. Please just look at point O on your notes there. Say, O oh Muslims, we believe... Oh, first of all, I need to again just remind you that the, the Bible is the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel, and the Quran talks about these. And it says, say, O oh Muslims, we believe in Allah... And that which was revealed unto us, Muslims, and that which was revealed unto Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and to Jacob and the tribes, and that which Moses and Jesus received, 
and that which their prophets received from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and unto him we have surrendered. And that, that type of no distinction is four times in the Quran. The Quran will actually talk about the, the scriptures that it's referring to, and it will say in point F, when there comes to them, to Jews and Christians, a scripture, the Quran from Allah, confirming that in their possession. And so when it's talking about these books that it's saying make no distinction of these holy books, it, the books it's talking about are the books that the Christians and Jews have. Now some Muslims will say, yes, but Surah 2 verse 79 says that uh, the Jews changed these, these books. But please have a look at point Q. And you'll see that the people who changed the books aren't just Jews. Look at verse uh, Q. Among them are an unlettered folk who know not the scripture except from hearsay, but they guess. Therefore, woe unto them who write the scripture with their hands and say, this is from Allah. So you see, the Jews that it's talking about are those who don't actually know the scriptures. It's not talking about Jews who do know the scriptures, it's talking about those who don't. And so the Quran throughout assumes that the Bible is reliable. In Surah 10 verse 94 in your notes, Muhammad is told if he's in doubt to consider, the, to, to, to consider those who read these books. These books are referred to as, those, uh, as proof that Muhammad is a prophet because he is foretold in them. But I think point U is a great one. It says there, Perfect are the words of thy Lord in truthfulness and justice. No man can change his words. Now, in that verse, it's actually not just saying that you can refer to the Bible, but it's declaring that no one can change the word of God. Well, to conclude, tonight we've considered the preservation of the Bible and the Quran. I've shown that the Bible has had one unchanged message over 1,500 years, and this shows it's, that it has been preserved. We've also considered the, the manuscripts and how scholars can confirm to us that it has been well preserved. We've also seen that, uh, that the Quran supports this idea. And so I call upon Muslims not to exaggerate about the Quran, but instead to come and read the prophets of God. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Please let us welcome Abdullah Kundi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah, amabad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And for the Christians and, and the uh, unaffiliated, I'm greeting you with a greeting that it's reported that our Master Jesus, peace be upon him, said in both the Gospel and the Quran, peace be with you. It'd be nice to hear also with you, but I guess it's not an Anglican church. No, that's okay. Um, I'll take a look a little bit of a different bent uh, to, to Samuel. I'm not focusing so much on what we say uh, about the Qur'an and even so much what we say about the Christian scriptures, uh, but what some more objective evidence has to say about both. With regards to what I'm going to be suggesting tonight, first of all, I'll be suggesting that uh, the Qur'anic text has not changed at least since within two years of the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, and that this can be known through objective fact, uh, and that one would really have to go out on a bit of a limb to deny this with any uh, rationality intact. The second proposition that I'll put forward is that the Christian scriptures, and this is what I'm focusing on tonight, because really, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible uh, is, is, is a completely different game in of itself, but I'll be happy to talk about it in the questions and answers. Uh, the Christian scriptures absolutely uh, have been changed in the last 2,000 years. And again, this is something that we can know through objective fact, and we would have to go on out, uh, out on a bit of a limb, again, to deny it, uh, like Norman Geisler kind of did. Uh, so regardless of what you happen to think right now, and I'm not expecting that anyone in the room is really going to change what they think right now, uh, by the end of the night, I'd really like you to, to ask yourself these questions. From what you've seen, regardless of what I think, 
is it highly likely, somewhat likely, or not really likely that the Qur'an has remained the same for the last 1,500 years? And with regards to the Christian scriptures, same questions, highly likely, somewhat likely, or not that likely that it stayed the same for the last 2,000 years? And for both, why? You know, why have you concluded that? Not just because you particularly like my hat and didn't like the fact that Samuel wasn't wearing a tie. So some quick theology for those that don't know. Uh, we believe that the Qur'an was revealed over approximately 23 years in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, we believe that God revealed it to the Prophet sometimes through the angel Gabriel, sometimes directly. Uh, we also uh, affirm, and indeed this is affirmed from secular history, that the socio-political environment that the Prophet and his companions were in over this period changed dramatically. Uh, and I'm sure that most people would agree with that also, given the, the current reality of the world, uh, and that this continued to be amplified even more so into early Muslim history. Now, I'll say that these two points are highly relevant because I'm going to touch on them a little bit later when we talk about Uthman and, and uh, his potential changes to the Qur'an or lack thereof. But the critical thing that I really want you all to get is that we believe that the Qur'an is the word of God. Now, having said that, we don't believe that God speaks Arabic. Uh, we don't believe that he speaks in words, letters or sounds. We believe that these are all created things and to say that he would be subject to them is, is completely irrational and, and goes against what our revelation says. Uh, but we believe that what the Qur'an says indicates some of what his eternal attribute of speech indicates and his eternal attribute of speech, if it could be heard by us now, would indicate everything. Okay? So it's not like he stops talking and starts talking like I do now. No, we don't, we don't believe that. Okay? And if you can kind of understand that, then you'll understand one of the points that we're going to talk about when I differentiate between supposed variants of the Qur'an and multiple readings of the Qur'an. So that's why uh, that's critically important. Try and bear that in mind. I know this is going to be a lot of information really quickly because I've got 20 minutes, is that right? Or 25? Oh, fantastic. Uh, should be able to get a bit more out in that. Uh, so the first point is that the Quran acknowledges uh, a lot of the problems that, that people mention now, uh, you know, supposed problems that, that indicate some, you know, convenience, so to speak, to the revelation. So the Quran says, yes, uh, it, it has been revealed um, periodically. Yes, uh, it doesn't have any contradictions. Uh, it also goes on to say um, that you may ask questions about the Quran, you may doubt it, but come up with a reason for why you doubt it. Okay, so we don't open to the first page and it says, look, this is from God, we're not going to tell you why, but just take it on face value. The Quran says this is a book from God containing within it um, information about every matter and if you disbelieve that, we'll then find a contradiction. And if you disbelieve that, we'll then think about the reality of how it was revealed over a 23-year period and what happened in that time. And if you still disbelieve that, we'll then look at objective evidence. And if you still disbelieve it, we'll then have a good reason for it. And another thing that people often touch on, and, and this is also not unique to uh, criticism of Islam, it's obviously... Uh, a criticism of the Christian scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures as well, the idea that stories are repeated more than once, uh, and this indicates multiple authors and all that sort of stuff. Uh, well, the Quran actually says why it, re it repeats stories more than once, you know, to, to emphasise the, the meaning. Um, I'm not sure that the Christian scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures do the same, but again, perhaps we can talk about that. Now, in terms of how the text was collected, yes, the first time it was collected into one book was immediately after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when Abu Bakr an, was the first uh, Islamic president. Uh, so within six months to 12 months of his death was the first time it was collected. Yes, uh, the Prophet wasalam, didn't collect it into one book, but it was written uh, on things when he was alive. There's no doubt about that. And the, and the proof of that, I guess, from our perspective, is that there are multiple narrations that attest to the idea of there being something written down. One of the most famous stories that most Muslims would know is a conversion story of Omar, the second Islamic president. Uh, he converted after reading part of the Quran in, in Mecca. Okay, so obviously for him to read it, it had to be written down. Now, indeed, there's secular scholars that affirm this story. Um, Examples would be William Montgomery Watt, 
uh, and Fred Donner, uh, both prominent Orientalists. Uh, William Montgomery Watt no longer with us. Fred Donner still currently teaching Oriental studies in the United States of America. Uh, and we could go on and on. Honestly, the majority of Orientalists would more or less affirm that the Quran uh, was dictated by the Prophet Muhammad. Obviously, they wouldn't agree with the divine origin, but they would also affirm that it was dictated over a period of approximately 23 years, started at a particular point and obviously ended with his death. Now, this is a very practical reason as to why the Prophet never instructed people to put it into a, a single book while the revelation was happening. Um, because the revelation isn't coming from the Prophet, it's coming from God. Okay, so he doesn't know when it's going to come and, and when it's going to stop. And producing books 1,500 years ago wasn't exactly as easy as you know, getting on lulu.com and becoming a self-publisher. Uh, it was actually very difficult. And the collapse of the Roman Empire also led to a loss of uh, transportation of paper. It led to a loss of production of papyrus. And so here is an example of what a book would have looked like in that time. Now, you can imagine that if you're going to be constantly ripping out pages, adding in uh, more pages, separating pages and adding in more verses and so on, because the Quran wasn't revealed chronologically, it was revealed in various uh, parts at different times, it's not really going to be very practical. And it's, it's going to take a lot of resources, and you're just going to have a big pile of pages and half-done books at, at the end of it. So that's the simple reason as to why it didn't happen. Nothing more sinister than that. What's the story behind the collection under Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu? Well, it's very simple. After the Prophet died, they knew that there was not going to be any more revelation. That's it. So that's why they collected it. And the mere fact that they collected it at this time also indicates that there were no changes made from, from there on in. Now, some Orientalist scholars on the fringe have suggested, although it hasn't really been prominent since the 1970s, that the Quran wasn't even written down until about 200 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Absolutely not the case, and I'll give you some evidence for that. Funnily enough, Samuel's actually quoted some of it in his notes. Um, but it's important to understand a couple of things here because they're often uh, questioned from the, the non-Muslim perspective. The first, reason, the first question that non-Muslims who actually know a little bit about this story is that um, why was the companion Zayd ibn Thabit chosen to collect the Quran and not someone who knew more, like, for example, the companion Samuel referred to often, Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud. And the simple reason is that Zayd Ibn Thabit was a man of about my age uh, at the time, probably a little bit older than me, uh, and he was also with the Prophet wasalam, at the final time that the revelation was reviewed in the last Ramadan when the Prophet was alive. Uh, Ibn Mas'ud, on the other hand, was quite old by this point. Uh, I think in his early 60s by this point. Okay, um, and that's the simple reason as to why. Bear in mind that the Islamic nation at this point, in the years of Abu Bakr, um, was already heading towards uh, the, the Levant uh, and also contained much of Persia. So it was already a sizable uh, area and in order for someone to be able to cross the area in a relatively short amount of time, you know, one would have to be young. We can't just get in the limo and drive around in air conditioning. Uh, travel was actually very difficult back then. Now, as I said, Orientalists such as Arthur Jeffrey are very prominent uh, in, in Christian apologetics, uh, even though he's long deceased. Consider this to have been a private collection, you know, because it didn't include Abdullah ibn Masud. That's just a fairy tale. Uh, and it's a fairy tale because, first of all, we actually have collected, and again, Samuel's quoted them, uh, a hadith that referred to what Abdullah ibn Masud thought at the time, even though it would go against what we actually think, if we look at them literally. Uh, and secondly, we have thousands and thousands more that attribute to the opposite, that say that it was a public collection. So in terms of weighing evidence, even if we were to get one person's point of view versus thousands, um, we're going to take the thousands over the one. And it's not, it's not good to pick and mix sources, you know, when we want to be convenient and try and develop opinions. So then, uh, after the time of Abu Bakr and after the presidency of Omar, uh, there was then another collection by the Khalif Uthman, the third Islamic president. Now, some people may ask, well, why collect again? The reason here is very, very simple. Remember that I said in the time of Abu Bakr, the Islamic nation had just started to spread 
into the Levant and contained most of Persia. At this time, when uh, Othman took over as Islamic president, the Islamic nation had spread from Morocco to China. Um, so it's obviously covering a much larger part of the world. Now, not only uh, are we covering a much larger part of the world, but we're covering a much larger um, type of languages and cultures and so on, in particular different Semitic languages, okay, which, which can um, potentially cause problems when reading the Qur'an or understanding the Qur'an. And again, we're going to talk about an example of that as we go on. Also, the number of Muslims had ballooned um, from approximately 50,000 or so in the time of Abu Bakr to now over a million. Okay, so times had basically changed. And, and what did this mean practically in terms of the text of the Qur'an itself? It meant that more people required uh, a copy of the Qur'an. It also meant that people required a direct uh, line of transmission of the Qur'an and not something that was going to be convoluted and combined from different teachers with different teaching styles. It could then potentially lead to misunderstanding. So uh, Othman used the codex that was collected by Abu Bakr as the standard for his collection. And then several copies of this were distributed to the various major centres of the Islamic nation at the time. Now remember that I said it spread from Morocco to China and basically everywhere in between. Uh, and there were only seven copies sent to these major centres. And then at each major centre there was basically an auditor who would go out and speak to people and say this is the authoritative copy if you're going to write a copy down. Again, why would we do that? Well, the Arabic alphabet and writing system was still developing in this time. It developed actually, you know, for a couple of hundred years after. But this was to set a standard in particular for the orthography, okay, so that people would not potentially get confused, all right. Now, as I said, some Orientalists, and, and every now and then there'll be a a particular brand of missionary will suggest that, well, Othman could have made changes to the text in this time. You know, he burnt them all that didn't agree with him, he could have made changes, or at the very least, he was the one that decided what was in it and what wasn't. If there were dramatically different Qur'ans to what we have today, if there are even Qur'ans that are only slightly different from what we have today, uh, we would actually have at least one or two considerable variants, variant manuscripts. Now, the idea that Othman collected every single manuscript or page of the Qur'an that existed in his time as president and burnt them all if they didn't agree with him is just pure fantasy. You know, to now, in the modern day, collect every copy of a single book between Morocco and China would be impossible let alone to do it in about a 12-month period when immediately after uh, there's, a, there's a rebellion starting in your nation, a rebellion that eventually would kill Othman only a few years later. Okay, so the idea that he could have done any of that stuff is just absolutely non-rational. Now, there's no other word for it. So what do we mean when we talk about the seven ahruf? Uh, well, Ultimately, yeah, this, this is something that we have different opinions on. But the, the general majority opinion, as far as uh, Orthodox Islam is concerned, is that the Qur'an was revealed in the seven prominent Arab dialects that existed at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, And the reason why it was revealed in this way was to conform with the challenge that exists in the Qur'an to bring something like it, to bring an, bring an Arabic Qur'an like it. Now, obviously, if I say, well, bring an English book like X, and I say, but I want you to be speaking in, you know, Australian English uh, and using standard Australian slash British spelling and so on, and then give that to someone from the US, well, they're going to be immediately at a disadvantage. Okay, they're going to have to review a particular type of English, they're going to have to review a particular type of spelling that's alien to them. Th this is the reason why the Quran was revealed in this way. And to give some examples of differences that scholars have quoted, it's purely in pronunciation. This is not what I'll be talking about when I talk about the different recitation methods. Okay, completely different. All right. What about the variants? And, and again, Samuel reported some of them. Well, I would contend, as I said at the start, that there are no Quranic variants. Absolutely none. There's no objective evidence that there's a variant of the Quran. Uh, now, do I think that the Quran hasn't changed, not even to a dot? Uh, no, but I'll talk about that more in my rebuttal section because Samuel brought it up. I would like to propose that a variant of a text uh, is 
a text which was different in content, whether it be uh, written and read, ideally. Um, it's different in its detail and form, and it also generates a distinct meaning. That's what I'll call a variant. Okay? Uh, and I'll say that a multiple reading is a reading of a text which may be vocally different to another, but has no bearing upon content, detail, and form, and doesn't generate a distinct meaning. So bearing those in mind, we'll talk about the seven recitation methods, and Samuel put some of them up. Uh, there's actually 10. Uh, in order for a recitation method to be valid, it needs to be what we would consider to be mutawatir, or certain. And that chain that Samuel was talking about needs to be traced back impeccably to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So yes, we have 10 different ways of reading the Qur'an, all which are traced back certainly to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. But the interesting thing about them, and indeed Orientalist scholars have touched on this, is that each uh, recitation method has the same skeleton orthography, so the same written text in the skeleton form, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. And also, each recitation method gives no difference in meaning. Now, Samuel quoted one example that he thought was one, but we'll talk about different ones, and I'll talk about that one specifically in my rebuttal time. Here's a couple of examples, the differences in two recitation methods according to Imam Hafs and Imam Warash. Now, before I actually talk about the differences in orthography, because one is North African script and one is uh, Iraqi script, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, I want you to be able to appreciate, for those that can't actually read Arabic, that the words look similar, you know, the orthography looks similar, okay? And the reason for that is that they come from the same skeleton text. They conform to the same skeleton text rules. Now, for those that can read Arabic but want to doubt me, one may say, well, uh, over here we've got wow alif, and then on the other side, and now I'm looking at the top left, we have a wow and then no alif. Why is that the case? Well, simply, the alif was not written. Uh, and we're going to give examples of, of that. But the point here is that you can see it doesn't look different. And as I said, for those of you that can't read, it doesn't look different. Uh, and for those of you that, that also want to take in the meaning, the meaning is the same. Okay? Uh, and as I said, I'll talk about the examples that, that Samuel gave in the rebuttal section, to be fair to him. Now, here is an early manuscript of the Qur'an. Uh, it's actually one of the Sana'a manuscripts from Yemen, um, dating to within 10 years of the death of the Prophet, they said to say, approximately. Uh, most Orientalist scholars actually date this to be in the time of the Caliphate of Abu Bakr. So he was president for two years after the Prophet died, and then he died himself. So very close to the time of the Prophet. Now, for those of you that have absolutely no appreciation of Arabic, you'll get my point here. You'll see that there are no dots indicating particular consonants. Okay, you'll see that there are no short vowels indicating short vowels. And if you're really astute and can actually read, you'll see that the alif is only written when it comes after a lamb. Otherwise, the alif isn't written. Okay, because that's the way that Arabic writing happened in this period of history. That changes slightly, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. First of all, I'd like to look at a secular supporter of this, uh, Adrian Brockett, and he's certainly no friend of Muslims in the sense that he's not a Muslim, he doesn't believe that the Qur'an is divinely revealed. But he did his PhD thesis on the differences between the Hafs and Warsh recitation methods. Now, I've got a lot of parts of his PhD thesis here, um, I'm not going to go through all of them, I'm just going to focus on the bold. Now remember that he is an independent Orientalist scholar, not a friend of, of Muslims. He first says that no difference has any effect on the meaning. While he does then go on to give an example which he says may have an effect on the meaning, uh, I'm sure that Samuel's going to bring that up, so I'll leave it to him. Uh, he also says that not, not one of the graphic differences, that's the way that it's written, caused the Muslims any doubts about the faultlessly faithful transmission of the Qur'an. Now, this is despite the fact that, you know, for the last 1,300 years, we've had the hadith that Samuel quoted. Okay, we've had the different recitation methods that I've spoken about and that Samuel's spoken about. We've never doubted this. Why? Well, because as he even concludes, all of the realities of the text point to a remarkably unitary transmission in both their graphic and oral form. And he goes on ultimately to say that the limits of their variation clearly establish that they are a single text. You may start to think, well, how is this different from the Christian story? 
uh, God willing, I'll get there in my time. Uh, he also goes on to give his theories as to how this could have occurred, but ultimately it's important that his final conclusion states that there was no active effort from the Muslims to actually maintain the text to this level of integrity. It just happened. It happened because everyone knew what it meant, everyone knew what it was supposed to say, and the little differences come up because of the differences in writing style that emerge uh, over the ensuing centuries. So here's an example of the development of Arabic writing. Uh, the manuscript on the right-hand side is a couple hundred years after the one that I showed you before, and you probably can't really see it in this light, but if you could, you would note that there's red dots above letters now. These are indicating consonants, all right? Um, again, the light's a bit bright. You can't really see that uh, this manuscript here, which is about 50 years after it or so, very similar now to a more modern Qur'an, has actually developed a short vowel system. Right. Now, someone may ask, you know, why did this happen? Well, for those that don't know much about linguistics and how writing emerged, um, you know, people didn't wake up one day and decide to start writing. Uh, writing systems developed independently from one another as language groups broke away from one another. So in the Middle East, um, you know, the predominant language groups that still exist today would be Syriac, Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, all three of them uh, each developed their own unique system of writing. Uh, Syriac actually came first, but then developed a modern script, because Arcadian's a little bit cumbersome, uh, then Hebrew, then Arabic. Now you can see here that this, these proto-Arabic writings on the left-hand side don't really look too similar um, to what we have in the Qur'an today. That's just how writing developed, all right? It's nothing more sinister than that. A thousand years later from these, we get something that looks very much like a modern day Quran. Now I'm oversimplifying it, but it's because I've got about five minutes to talk about it. Now, as I said, understanding this clears up the idea about the Quran changing not even to a dot, um, because, well, the dots didn't even exist at the time. All right. Uh, now we're regularly accused of not making manuscripts available for people to look at or buying them and destroying them and that sort of stuff. Well, the bottom line is there's loads. Loads and loads, thousands and thousands of pages. Sana'a manuscripts are a prime example. Now these are freely available on the internet. One of them here is a UN website, not controlled by Muslims. So jump on, take a look. The idea that we keep them secret is, again, false. Sometimes statements get repeated and ultimately people just start to believe them. So some very common ones from Gerda Puen is that 20% of the Quran cannot be understood, it makes no sense, that the Sana'a manuscripts have been photographed and they show uh, significant differences and variants and Muslims will have to accept that the Qur'an has changed, that's it. Uh, and also the Qur'an is a cocktail of texts that was collected after, well after the death of Muhammad. Um, he's been saying these things since the, since the 70s and never presented an example. You know, just because you say things doesn't make them true. Uh, I'll leave it there and um, talk about the Christian scriptures in my next session. Thank you very much. Let us please welcome Samuel for his first 10 minute reply. Thank you for that, Abdullah. It's always great to hear from you. Um, I'll quickly go through some of the points you raised there. Uh, you, you began by talking about the idea of contradiction. Um, I'm not gonna go into that. We've done that in other debates. Certainly I would see that there are contradictions in the Quran. I don't have all those references handy. One that I can remember is uh, regards to the punishment for sexual immorality, where in one case it's in, in, um, to be confined to the home. At a later surah, it's uh, a beating. And then within the hadith, it is, uh, it, it is uh, stoning. And so the, these are the contradictions. Well, uh, Islamic scholars would say that this is part of abrogation, but we've got those things there. But I guess what I want to do is, is just focus on the text, because even if there is a contradiction, it may well be preserved. And so to me, that's not really the issue, because there may be contradictions and they've been preserved, because that's just how the book was. So I don't think that really engages with the answer. Okay. What I want to do now, though, is to quickly look at um, I'll, first, I want to say that I agree with you that it, was, uh, that it was written down during the time of Muhammad. I don't disagree there. But as I tried to point out in that hadith, at point H in your notes, there were significant differences. Abdullah was saying that the differences 
don't really like that to, to qualify as a difference, it actually has to change something. Well, this does make a change. So when Surah 92 verse 3 was recited as by the male and the female, that is to swear by creation, which is animistic. But in the second version of that uh, verse, by him who created male and female, that's monotheistic. And so I'd say that that is a different concept of God between those two understandings of that verse, and that that's a different theology being expressed there. He was saying that most of the Santa manuscripts agree with the Uthman Quran that we have today, and I'd agree with that. And he was saying, and so we shouldn't listen to just the one manuscript that says one thing. But my point is that Uthman did, and the Hadith does record that Uthman issued a standardising of the text. And as I gave in your quote in point, where was it, point L, that Uthman did order for the burning of the text. Now, whether or not, you know, Abdullah was saying that's impossible to do, but I'm just quoting from the Hadiths that say that Uthman did issue that burning and the standardising. It was interesting that one of the pictures he put up of the ancient Qurans there, actually you could see that underneath it was the text of another Quran that had been washed off and then the new Quran written on top. And that's actually where the scholars are actually getting these variants from the Qurans uh, when, they're, when they're looking at these old manuscripts because, as Abdullah pointed out, the Qurans were expensive. Books were expensive. You actually didn't burn them. They were like a whiteboard. You could wash them off. But you know when you write on a whiteboard with a wrong pen and it, you rub, try to rub it off but it still sort of stays there a bit? That's what we're finding with these old manuscripts, that there's the, the original first script written underneath it. And scholars look at that and that's where these variants come from. Now, just at that point, he was saying that... Uh, uh, Dr. Purin hasn't really provided any evidence. Well, he, he has provided evidence, and I gave that as a quote for you. Where, where, is, where is this? I'm taking a little time to do this, unfortunately. Uh, at point K, I won't read all of it out, but it, it's about the, 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 the manu that they've actually found manuscripts that follow the order of the surahs of Abdullah ibn Masud. So there is evidence there, and also his wife has also done this work, and I've got a picture of her material here where they've actually got significant textual variants and they compare it where there's whole phrases missing compared the modern Quran to, to this one here. So, you know, Dr. Purin is publishing this material and you, you can go and find it. But it's not just him who, who's doing it, it's also the early Muslims. So, uh, uh, when the but when a scholar like Al-Tabari would quote the Quran, sometimes he would quote from the Uthman text, other times he would quote from the Abdullah ibn Masud text. And you find those types of quotes within his material. He always just didn't quote from one Quran, sometimes he would quote from another, a verse or something it may be, and you can find that. I don't have the exact references here, but I can certainly find them, and I have them on my site. Now, Abdullah was saying that Uthman burned the Qurans in order to standardise the orthography. But that's not what the Hadith says. What the Hadith says is that the, the Quran was being recited differently and because of this, Uthman took these steps. That's what the Hadith says. It may well have resulted in a standardising of the orthography, but that's not the reason that is given in the Hadiths. The reason that is given is that there were different versions being recited and this was causing trouble for the Muslims and so this standardising effect needed to, to, to come about. He also mentioned that the, the seven araf uh, or the, the, the seven ways of reciting the Quran that Muhammad did allow, that, that these are best understood by scholars as being the different dialects within the Arabian Peninsula. However, I, I disagree with that view because the scholars I've read don't say that. And in Bukhari, let me get the reference here, Bukhari, volume six, book 61, Hadith 114, we see Umar ibn al-Khattabi was arguing with uh, Hisham bin Hakim about the reciting of a verse of the Quran. And so they both went to Muhammad and Muhammad said, oh, you can actually see that, can't you? Great. And, um, oh, you probably can't see it, it's a bit fine. But, they came to Muhammad, and, and this is where Muhammad speaks about the haraf, the seven different ways. But the thing is, both of those men are from the same tribe. So they both speak the same dialect. And that's why Muslim scholars say that the seven haraf are not dialects, because the hadiths we have for it are from people from the same tribe. 
Now, I put up my, my, my examples of, of, the, of the differences between those Qurans that I've got there, and honestly to you, they do change the meaning. One where it says, Kul Rabi Ya'ilamu, that's the imperative, God saying you to do it. And the other one is in the indicative, it's saying, Kala Rabi Ya'ilamu, it's saying Muhammad did it. That changes the subject of that clause. Now, again, I'm not trying to exaggerate it and say this makes the Quran completely irrelevant or corrupts the whole message, but I'm saying there are, there are differences there. The other example I gave was where the prophets killed or the prophets were killed, active or passive. That changes the meaning. I'm not trying to exaggerate it. I'm just saying that these differences are there. Now, you referred to Adrian Brockett, and you said he's no friend of Muslims. Well, I'd actually encourage you to find out the latest work that Adrian's doing, because I believe he's stopped all of his work in that area, and he's working in Christian-Muslim friendship. So he actually seeks to be, uh, for as far as I know, he's stopped doing that work so that he can work on building friendship with Muslims. He certainly does say there is a single text, and I agree with that. I agree, I'm not disagreeing with Adrian Brockett at all that there is a single text. But what Adrian Brockett is saying is that that's the Uthman text. And so I'm not disagreeing with that. He's saying that there are different oral traditions to this text, but that the text has been, that the skeleton of the text has been preserved. I would agree with that. But I would also say that when you look at the differences between these Qurans, as Adrian did, when you look at them, the vast majority of them are there because. Uh, that they, uh, they occur where the Arabic text is vague. So because the Arabic has to have dots and dashes to signify vowels and what case it's in, and, and as Abdullah pointed out, they weren't written in the first manuscripts, because they weren't there, what you find is that th these different readings are all the different options you could possibly come up with. And in fact, there are some, uh, there are some quotes, which I don't have right here, but they talk about there being 50 different readings uh, which were applied to this skeleton, and then only some of them were selected. So there's a lot more than the ones we've got here. The ones we've got here are the ones that have been considered authentic. I think I will leave it at there. Thank you very much. Let's welcome Abdullah up as he gives his rebuttal. All right, I'm going to talk very quickly about why I'm confident that the Christian scriptures that we have today have changed significantly from what we would have had, say, 2,000 years ago if we could have had originals. Uh, the reason why I'm going to tell you about this is because I want you to have the reason, uh, particularly for the Christians here in the audience, as to why I don't read the Bible, why I don't think it's true. You know, I think it's something that Christians don't often uh, understand immediately from us. And also, it's going to answer a couple of the points that I would have uh, used in rebuttal anyway. So starting very quickly with the gospel according to Mark, uh, it's most likely the earliest gospel, quite possibly written by John Mark, a companion of uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, interesting that it's written for Greek speakers but actually quotes Jesus speaking Syriac uh, and then translates it, translate it for uh, Greek speakers. And the examples are chapter 5 verse 41, chapter 7 verse 11. Uh, another interesting thing about the Gospel according to Mark is although it would have been written around, say, 30, 40, 50 CE, if we believe in the original, the earliest partial manuscript that we have is P45, and that's dated to around about the start to the middle of the third century. Okay, so separated by a significant amount of time from the original. Now, what can we know about this Gospel without being um, sensationalist, just being real, most of you will actually have these details in your Bible today. Uh, well, first of all, and again, Samuel referred to this, verses 9 to 20 in the final chapter uh, were absolutely introduced uh, pretty much after the Greek manuscript tradition ended. So about 500 years after the text would have initially been written. And the reality is we don't know how, how the Gospel ends. And these verses would comprise around about 2% of the total corpus of the gospel itself, you know, because of how small it is. Uh, now, Bruce Metzger himself, and Samuel quoted him, and he, he was a committed Christian, uh, attests to this, that these verses are absolutely not part of the original, no, no doubt whatsoever. I interestingly enough, also, verse one, uh, verse, uh, the first verse is uh, disputed amongst early manuscripts. Some of them include the Son of God, some of them don't. All right. Now, that's an interesting point. Now, then when we go on to say there's literally dozens of variants 
in the manuscript, the earliest manuscripts of Mark, and the earliest one that we have is about 200 years after it would have been written. That raises serious questions about what I can actually know about that gospel. Now, Samuel, and this is point C on Samuel's note, oh, sorry, point E, he quoted Norman Geisler and said that if a single letter is different in a word, that counts as a variant. Well, the gospel according to Mark gives a prime example of where a single letter difference in a word can actually make a significant difference in the meaning. If we go to um, uh, chapter 1, verse 41, uh, there's two Greek words that appear, different Greek words, that appear in different manuscript traditions. One is ethrahem, and the other one is ethraem. Okay, one means angry, one means compassion. Okay, for those of you that know this verse, you'll know that in most Bibles today it says that Jesus saw the leper and then showed compassion. Some of the earliest versions, and the earliest versions indeed, say that Jesus got angry. Okay, and the difference between these two words is one letter. Yeah, that's a variant. You know, the meaning is completely different. So how much of that can be relied upon? Uh, the Gospel according to John, I would give a similar argument. We know that the precope adulterae is absolutely not existing in the Gospel according to John in the first 400 years of its manuscript tradition. So f at least 400 years after the original author of John wrote the Gospel, someone included the story about Jesus forgiving the adulterer and, uh, adulteress, sorry, and now it's in every Bible that we have today. You know, these are objective facts. They're not sensationalists. We can look at the epistle according to the Hebrews. It has anonymous authorship. We don't know who wrote it. Now, it was initially included in the canon at the Council of Trent because the scholars at the time thought that it was written by the Apostle Paul. We now know it was written over 100 years after Paul would have died. Uh, and interestingly enough, the same council excluded another book, The Shepherd of Hermas, because it had anonymous authorship. Okay, so the reality is within your scripture today, you have massive chunks that were included hundreds of years after the time of Jesus, and at times we don't even know who the authors were. What does that actually say about the text? Now, I'm not talking about the spelling mistakes that have no bearing on the meaning. I'm talking about the real stuff. And there's enough of the real stuff, really, for me to have pretty significant doubt. Uh, I'll go on to touch on a couple of the points that Samuel spoke about with regards to the Quran. Now, it's interesting that one of the verses that he quoted, Ketulun uh, versus Ketulun, like, you know, basically the verse is saying that the prophets fought in the name of God or they were fought in the name of God, meaning that people fought them because they believed in God. It doesn't change the meaning. Only if one changes the potential English word so that they fought or were killed does it then actually change the meaning of the verse. Now, this has been convenient with translation, and indeed, um, there are a couple of convenient translations, and I'm not saying that this is Samuel's fault. I don't think that he's done this intentionally. There are a lot of English translations out there that include this sort of stuff. If we look at point R, for example, on his notes, when it says, uh, so if you were in doubt of what has been revealed to you, then ask those who have the scriptures revealed before you. Uh, yes, there are some English translators, most of them non-Muslim, that translate this to refer to the prophet, when it says kunta, you. Okay, but there's... You'll note there that the brackets mean that that word is added in by the translator. Okay? Most of us would say that this isn't referring directly to the prophet. It's an instruction for the prophet to tell the pagan Arabs who had never heard of the idea before of one God or that there's prophets or that revelations come to go and ask the Christians and the Jews at the time. And even they would be able to attest to that. You know, whether their scriptures were intact or not, they would be able to attest to this reality. Um, as I said, there are some that give a, give a different interpretation, but that's fine, you know. Uh, moving on, uh, another, well, another technical point. Ibn Kathir, who's quoted uh, in, in Samuel's point, uh, point uh, N, is not an early scholar. Uh, he's a late scholar. Uh, he died about 500 years ago, um, 600 years ago. So we had about 1,000 years of scholarship before he was even born. Uh, and in terms of whether we agree about reading the Basmala or not, uh, everyone agrees that it's part of the Revelation because there are chapters of the Qur'an that contain the Basmala in, within the chapter, not at the start of the chapter, within the chapter. Now, in terms of whether it should be read before or not is actually a jurisprudential issue. It's not a theological issue. It's about whether you should start the prayer by saying it audibly or not or whether you should start when you're reading the Qur'an audibly with the Basmala or not. It's not about whether we think it's part of the Qur'an or not. You know, all Muslims believe that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of the Qur'an, full stop. 
There's absolutely no Muslim that would not believe that. Um, as I said, you know, we're confusing technical points versus textual points. Um, going on, point S, uh, Samuel quoted uh, verse 568, uh, chapter 5, verse 68. But if we read the end of the verse, and if we read the verse that comes before it, this is God telling the prophet what a true Muslim is. And it's saying that if the people who claim to believe in the Torah and claim to believe in the gospel were following that, well, then basically they would be Muslim. And if you just read the ending of chapter 5, verse 68, so that's the first half of the verse. If you read the second half, you'll see that that is actually the meaning. Um, going on very quickly to a couple other technical points. I mean, we can say things, but that doesn't make them true. And we can show little graphics, but that doesn't make them true. Now, yes, Samuel is correct in saying that uh, Gerda Pyun and his wife and, and the people that support them have put out papers. They have shown no primary evidence. That's what I'm talking about, primary evidence. Now, notice I put up pictures of manuscripts, and Samuel was talking about um, a, a primary text being under the text written over it. Actually, what you see there is the shadow of what's on the other page coming through, but that's a different point. You know, you could only, you could only see the primary text under a UV light, but as I said, that's a, that's a different point. It's a technical point. Um, Dr. Pewin and his supporters have shown no primary evidence. Anyone can copy and paste in a modern Word document and say, oh, look, this is true. OK, no worries. Give me primary evidence. I mean, if we go to a doctor and the doctor says to you, you've got cancer, are you just going to accept it? Surely you'd want to see an X-ray or some kind of diagnostic rationale or whatever. Maybe you'll believe it immediately. All right, but what about when the chemo starts? Surely you're going to want some reason, right, as to why it's all happening. You know, we can't just take things because people claim that they're true. Give the primary evidence. Now, I'll be extra generous here to Samuel and quote the one scholar who has given an attempt at primary evidence showing a variant of the Qur'an. Her name is Alba Fideli, and she's actually, her, her paper is actually included in one of the, the books edited by uh, Dr. Puen, and it's on Fogg's palimpsest, which is a um, picture of this here. As you can see, very similar to the Sana'a manuscript that I put up at the start. Now, the idea here is that this manuscript conforms to a reading of Ibn Mas'ud. If you read her whole paper, there are verses that do and verses that don't. And what she's actually looking at, again, is what Samuel alluded to, the primary text, which is actually underneath what you can see here. And it's not the shadow that you can see. That's, as I said, on the reverse page. Uh, and, um, and she's attempted to conclude that it conforms to uh, a heterodox reading, single page manuscript. It's the only evidence that's been put forward. Now, the interesting thing is, even in her analysis, she conceded that she could not demonstrate that even a single verse reading difference was actually correlated here. She also conceded that um, reading a primary text underneath a secondary text with UV light is very, very difficult, and she couldn't even be certain that the primary text that had been washed off and then written over was actually part of the Qur'an. This is the only academic article that has ever been put forward uh, about a variant in the Qur'an, and even the author herself agrees that it's entirely speculative and comes with a presupposition. Now, on the converse, I've quoted basic facts about the Christian scriptures, and as I said, these are ones that I assume all of you would agree with, that your own Bibles would have written in them right now if you if you look at them. This is the reality of the question that we have to look at. I believe that the Qur'an is inerrant, that what I have today is the same as it was 1,500 years ago. I have absolutely no reason to believe the same about the Christian scriptures, and I don't mean to cause offence, but reject it wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. Please uh, welcome Samuel. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. I'll just uh, quickly address some of these issues. Uh, you brought up the point that the New Testament is in Greek, and, uh, but Jesus would have spoken Syriac, or it's referred to him in Syriac, or a type of Syriac at various points. Uh, the Syri Syriac and Arabic were two common languages, or Aramaic, were two common languages in that area. When Jesus was hung on the cross, it was written in Greek, Latin, and uh, Aramaic. I guess for us Christians, we see it the same way that you do in the Quran and that Jesus speaks in the Quran in 7th century Arabic 
and we understand that the same way you would see that that is Jesus speaking, we understand that Jesus' apostles, even more so, were speaking the language of the time, and they, they were the ones who wrote and transmitted this in the language of the time. You mentioned that Mark, uh, Mark 16, as I brought up, Mark 16 and, and uh, the 11 verses at the end of that, and John 11, uh, that you know, they're absolutely not in it. Well, we don't know if they're absolutely not in it. It's not as simple as saying they're absolutely not. Again, this is where we've got to look at the evidence and where I had that table for you, where I showed you the family trees of the copies and how scholars look at these and we can see where something has been introduced. And this is what we do. Now, Abdullah said it's, it's, it's massive chunks. Well, there's only two of them. They're not massive chunks. There are, there's 11 verses here, 11 verses there. And uh, th this is part of the, the work that we do, that we look at the ancient manuscripts, and if we see something like that, and there's only two of those, we can identify them. You mentioned that Hebrews wasn't part of the Christian canon in some places, and that's right, the Christians discussed this. But as I pointed out, the Quran also had different canons of the Quran. And so some of the surahs, some of the Qurans only had 111 surahs. Some of the Qurans had 116. That's a different canon, a different number of surahs in it. And so it's a question that we both have. I'm happy for you to bring it up, but it's equally f for the Quran as it is for the Bible. Christians and Muslims have both had to work out what, what to have in our books. And, and it's also interesting to note that Islam's not really based on the Quran anyway. It's based on the Quran and the Hadith, which is where the surah comes from. And so if you want to bring up canon questions, you really need to consider the Islamic canon, which is the Quran and the Hadith. And as far as the Hadith are concerned, Muslims vary enormously. You mentioned that Surah 10 verse 94 you know, is not referring to Muhammad or may not be. Well, most translators say that it is. And so I followed them. It's the... The, the, the second person plural pronoun for you, and they, trans, they uh, assume that it's referring to Muhammad there. You also mentioned that the Basmala, uh, you said it's absolutely part of the Quran, and I agree that it is mentioned in a verse within the Quran, but my, my point was, and the, uh, the quote I gave showed, that the Islamic scholars differ as to whether or not the Basmala is part of the revelation at the beginning of the surahs. And so there's 113 times where the majority of the Islamic scholars say that's not part of the revelation, and the minority say it is part of it. And I mentioned that, that was about 452 words that they disagree on. And so it may be elsewhere in the Quran, within a surah, but I'm saying at the beginning it's not certain and they differ. You said that Purin's put forward no evidence. Well, I've actually held up these which come from articles that him and his wife have done. They're in German. So you've, you've got to track them down, but there are things being published in that regard. But again, I, I would just want to say that with the Bible, we, we can look at the ancient copies that are there. They come over a long period of time. Scholars can look at them and they show that it's been very well preserved. And so I just want to say that we can have confidence reading the Bible. And I ask Muslim scholars to stop exaggerating about the Quran. Thank you very much. And Abdullah, your four-minute reply. Thank you. And thank you, Samuel, again. Uh, I'll just quickly go over a couple of these points. I know that I'm a minute down. So uh, first point, a technical theological point. We don't believe that it was Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, speaking in Arabic in the Quran. We believe that it's God talking in the Quran, and he's referring to what uh, Jesus said. Uh, now, it's interesting that Samuel said it's not as simple as absolutely not whether the ending of the Gospel according to Mark, the longer ending and shorter ending, should be in there or not, and whether the Pricope adultery should be in the Gospel according to John or not. Um, well, if it's not that simple, then you don't know. You know, you don't know what you have. You know, that's it. <laughs> you know, the, the conversation is over. Uh, Samuel also then went on to say, well, there's not massive chunks, there's only two of them. Well, no, I mean, I referred to another verse in Mark, the opening verse, where it says, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, in half of the earliest versions, it says that, and the other half of the earliest versions, it says, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and omits the Son of God. So was that said or was that not said? I also quoted another verse from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark where a single Greek letter has caused two different meanings to, to emerge. Okay? We can go on and on and on. We can go through every Gospel account. It's as simple as that. 
So we might not find massive chunks of 11 verses here, and in the case of the Gospel according to John, 18 verses there, but we'll find one verse with significant differences, and then two or three that most people agree on, most manuscripts agree on, and then another one with significant differences. So when we get to the end of it, the Christian needs to concede a certain threshold point. You know, well, I can be certain about 95% or 90% or 75% or whatever. You know, there needs to be a threshold point. It is absolutely not 100. That's it. You know, I mean, the conversation's over. With regards to us, however, and I'll just add one more point there. My issue with the epistle to the Hebrews wasn't that it was a late inclusion to the canon or whatever. It's that it has anonymous authorship. That's my issue. You know, so you've got books that you can't be sure about who wrote them. You know, not, not even a rough guide. So what does that mean? Uh, and very quickly, I'll repeat again what I said about Dr. Puin. I said pri primary evidence. Not an article that's been written with then Arabic done in Microsoft Word and, and obviously the rationale in German. Primary evidence, an actual manuscript. I quoted the only manuscript. You know, I mean, I've done... Uh, done Samuel a favour, I think, there, but primary evidence is what I'm talking about. Now, we have copious amounts of primary evidence with regards to the uh, errancy of the Christian scriptures, none with regards to the Quran, if you're willing to explain it in the way that I have. Now, if you're not, well, then you need to present that argument in at least, I think, a somewhat objective and academic way. Thank you very much. Samuel will have the first 10 minutes to read and answer the questions written down for him. And then Abdullah will have the next 10 minutes to read and answer the questions written for him. And then each gentleman will have 90 seconds to conclude. Thank you, Samuel. All right, well, thank you for your questions. The first one here to Samuel. I understand from what, uh, from what you said that there are discrepancies in both the Bible and the Quran, but yet they are, both the, but they are the word of God. So do you believe in the Quran? Well, I certainly do believe that there are textual variants within both the Quran and the Bible. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I was trying to outline. But I was also showing how for scholars this is not a problem because we have so many manuscripts spread out that they can identify these errors in transmission and correct for them. So it's not a problem. Now, so, so, but do I believe in the Quran? Uh, no, I don't believe in the Quran as the word of God. And the reason I don't is because of that first table in your notes. Remember when I showed you in the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel that they all teach that we're made in the image of God. They all teach that God is Father. They all teach the Son of God. They all teach sacrifice for sin. They all teach that God dwells with his people. They all teach that, that God keeps his covenants throughout. And so it's because the Quran doesn't have any of those that I say it's a completely different message and it doesn't conform to the earlier prophets and so I don't accept it. So you see, see, the gospel message that Christians believe that Jesus came amongst us, died for our sins, was raised again. This is not something just in the gospel. It is something which has its foundations in all of the prophets. And that's why we believe that. Did any prophet uh, prophesy about the coming of Muhammad? Well, as a Christian, I'd say no, he didn't. Muslims often point to Ju uh, in the Torah to Deuteronomy 18 where it says uh, to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like you, Moses. And they try to say that that is referring to Muhammad. Um, just from the context, when it says, I will raise a prophet up for you, Muhammad, from your brothers, that phrase, for your brothers, is used several times before in that chapter. And it refers to the king of Israel, that he will be from the brothers. And it, it refers to the priests, I think, as well. I'm not, you can go back and look at in that chapter. I can't remember all the references now. But it's used several times, and it always means a fellow Israelite. And so there's no reason to, to make it mean anything else than what it means in the context. Muslims will also refer to John chapter 14 to 16, where Jesus talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they'll say that that refers to Muhammad. But yet, it, it's the Holy Spirit. And the promise of Christianity is that if you put your faith in Jesus, that God will give you the Holy Spirit who will change you and will bring you into a relationship with God where you call him Father. 
Now, that was what the prophets before Jesus had said, and it's, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. It's not referring to Muhammad. There's the, the, just the context and the teaching is very clear with what it's referring to. Uh, in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus says that many will come after me that will lead you astray. Considering that Muhammad came after Jesus and spoke words, does that mean Muhammad is a false prophet and leading people astray? Well, I, again, I, I would say that because he doesn't agree with the earlier prophets, that, that's why I don't accept him as a prophet. And particularly when I see that Muslims don't read the earlier prophets. See, I wasn't always a Christian. I, there was a time when I became a Christian when I was 19, when I, I'd, I'd been trying to be as good as I could to live up to God's standard, and I just kept failing. And then one day a man explained to me what God had done for me in Jesus, that God had sent Jesus to pay for my sins, that God had done something to save me. And... And I said, that's exactly what I want. Now, when I became a Christian, the church taught me to read the Torah. The church taught me to read the Psalms. The church taught me to read all of the prophets. And this is the problem Christians have with what we see with Muhammad, that when Muhammad comes, he stops people from reading all the earlier prophets. And, uh, and, and we see that that's not the true work of God. Uh, you, say th oh, you say things, but that doesn't make them true. So I think you're quoting Muhammad here. You say things, but that doesn't make them true. No, sorry, not all of these have got names on them, so we've tried to sort them out as best we can. You say things, but that doesn't make them true. You can't just say things are true. There should be evidence. Why twist Muhammad and his uh, uh, solitary revelation and subsequent revelations? It's for, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have very many. I've only got two left. Okay. Um, what, discre what discrepancies are there in the Bibles? Oh, okay, so the, the, this was where Abdullah brought up the idea that in, at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, uh, at the first verse, some manuscripts say Jesus, uh, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Others say uh, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you need to understand that the phrase Son of God actually is a comes from the earlier prophets. It's in the prophets uh, 2 Samuel and in the Psalm, Psalm 2. And what it says is that the Messiah, the Christ, is the Son of God. And so when we see that at the beginning of that verse, it, it does look like it's been put in or, you know, you've, you've got to look at the evidence and see that maybe this is an expansion that one person's put on, the Christ, the Son of God, because it's a, a, a parallel idea. But again, what I would want to say here is that to understand that the Son of God, and it's talking here about not literally but figuratively, again, see, when Jesus talk about, when Christians talk about Jesus being the Son of God, what do we mean? Well, we mean what all of the prophets mean. The phrase the Son of God comes from the Torah, where Israel is called the Son of God. And then we read in the books of the prophets in 2 Samuel 7 that the King of Israel is called the Son of God. We also read about the Son of God in the book of Psalms. And now it's from all of this understanding that we have in the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel where we see it come to its fulfillment that we understand what this phrase means. I'm not going to go into all the details now because that's what we have church for. And that's why I invite you to come to church where we work through all of the prophets and we declare the whole counsel of God to people. And so um, now regarding that verse and how that there's a slight difference there and Abdullah brought up some of the others, I acknowledge those and I acknowledge them in my talk. I said, yes, they are there. Both books have got variants, but what I'm saying is the multitude of manuscripts spread widely abroad allows us to identify where those errors have crept in and to make correction for them. And so that's why the scholars are confident. Sam, can you please explain more about the isnad of the huffs? Yes, now, uh, what the isnad is is uh, for, the way that Islam does historical epistemology is that every bit of information has got to have a, a chain of narration, a list of the people who have passed it on. And so hadiths and readings of the Quran are not automatically accepted. They have to be authenticated. And the way that they're authenticated, or one of the ways, is through these chains of narration to show that the chain is a, uh, is a genuine chain and shows that things have been properly um, preserved over that time. Now, what I sought to do was to use the three rules of Islamic 
judging of chains, that it must be a complete chain, they must be trustworthy narrators, and it must be historically possible. And what I showed was that Abdullah ibn Masud in that chain is historically impossible or highly improbable because we've got ample evidence to show that Abdullah ibn Masud did not accept the Uthman Quran and actually opposed it and told his disciples to oppose it. And so to have him as a supporting narrator in that Quran is historically very unlikely and doubtful. So it's not a strong Sahih chain. That's what I was trying to do there. I guess the last point I just want to finish up with is again to talk about what we find in all of the prophets. You see, the word of God has been preserved for us. God has preserved his word. I also showed this in, in what the Quran testifies to the Bible itself. I showed on four occasions where the Quran says, make no distinction and that no one can change the word of God. And so I, I don't think that it's actually even true to the Quran to say that the Bible's been changed. And it's great that it hasn't been changed. It's great that God keeps his word. Because the prophets tell us about what God has done for us. This is the great thing about reading the Bible. It's a record of what God has done for us. That while we were dead in our sins, while we were unable to please God, while we were helpless, in fact, while we are going to face the wrath of God, that God has done something to save us. That God has done something to save us. And so we see this being revealed throughout the Torah, throughout the prophets, throughout the Psalms. And so Jesus comes, the Lord comes amongst us, dies on the cross to pay for our sins, the start of a new humanity, washed clean, God himself bearing our sins, God himself dealing with the problem that we can't deal with. You see, this is, this is why Christians read all the prophets. It's because all the prophets proclaim this gospel. This is why you go into church and they teach all the prophets, because all of these prophets provide the background for understanding the gospel of how God loves us and has sent Jesus to save us. Thank you very much. Samuel, you do have one minute remaining. Are there any questions from the floor for Samuel? Thank you, madam. Hello. Yes. Matthew to find out what Jesus was all about. So I, after reading the Quran and knowing what Jesus, Jesus was all about in the Quran, I found that I was shocked to find that his message was the same as it is in the Bible. The Jesus I knew from the Quran was the same as um, Jesus in the Bible. And what the next thing that I was shocked to find is that um, the Christians told me that this is the word of God. Have a read of it. So I did have a read of it thoroughly. And I researched it. And um, I wanted to ask you, if you think this is the word of God, then can it contain contradictions? Um, no. Well, so I, yes, I believe it's the word of God, and I don't believe it has contradictions. Now, I'm happy to deal with this. I just don't know how long this is going to go for. 40 seconds. Got, okay. okay. <laughs> um, the, just one example is that I came across myself is the death of Judas Iscariot. It's only mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew and in Acts. In only two places, the other Gospel do not mention how Judas Iscariot dies. In Gospel of Matthew, it said he went and hanged himself. And he threw the uh, 30 pieces of silver down onto the floor and returned the money. In Acts, it says that he um, went and uh, fell off the cliff, but, like, fell off, and all his, you know, about, like, everything gushed out, and that's how he died. And um, he bought the field, uh, the field with a piece of um, money that he got, 30 pieces of silver, that piece of uh, money he bought the field. So one says he returned the money, the other says he didn't return the money, he bought the field with the money, and one says he died by. Um, Hanging himself and what's the Sure. Okay. Just, um, just to clarify, um, thank you, sister. The, our friend here did not take up your 40 seconds. Your 40 seconds starts now. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you because um, I want to thank you for reading the, the, the Torah, Prophets, Psalms, and Gospel, and God bless you for doing that, and well done. But I want to say Abdullah in his talk was saying why he was confident, why he didn't need to. So we've actually had two very different opinions here, and I, I, I support your opinion. More power to you. I think that's fantastic. So I want to support that first of all, but generally what Christians are hearing is 
You know, don't read the Bible. That, that's, that's the general thing, and that's what Abdullah was saying tonight, that we don't need to go that way. Now, with, with, the, uh, uh, with uh, the death of Judas, what we see there is that in Matthew's Gospel, the money that he gives, we're actually told they go and, the, the priests go and buy the field. So that's how those two things fit together. Is the, I'm pretty sure it's the, the money is used to buy the field. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the pleasure of cutting you off. <laughs> Ten minutes for our friend Abdullah to answer his questions. Thank you, my friend. Now, as you can see, I have been blessed with a lot of questions. Probably won't be able to get through all of them in 10 minutes, so if I'm rushing, uh, don't take it as disrespect to your question. I just want to give justice to as many people as possible. And I omitted a couple that were just comments, uh, but I'll read them out later if anyone thinks I'm being convenient. Abdullah, you say you don't read the Bible and I uh, don't want to. How have you criticised it then? Uh, well, I should probably be a bit more precise in what I said. Uh, I obviously have read it before. Um, I studied the Hebrew Bible in particular at university. It was part of my undergraduate uh, degree, um, and uh, that's why I've come to the conclusion that I have. The point that I was making about I don't want to read it now is that it serves no benefit to me now, basically. I occasionally actually do quote it, funnily enough, when I send people Christmas cards and stuff like that. Yeah, Christ uh, Muslims actually do send Christmas cards to people. Uh, I have actually just quoted a, uh, a bit in uh, Syriac to some friends of mine. So, um, yeah, I do read it, but not for the purpose of, you know, finding any inspiration in it. I don't believe that there's any at all. You know, no more than in a uh, High quality Mills and Boone novel. Abdullah, let's say both books were changed. Where is the guarantee of salvation in the Quran? Isn't this the truth we are all searching for? Uh, well, first of all, I never conceded that the Quran has changed. I affirmed several times that I don't believe that it has. So I won't concede that point. But in terms of guarantee of salvation in the Quran, there's a verse that says very clearly that God has promised the believer's paradise. Very, very clear. So you're a believer, you promise salvation. That's, uh, that's basically it. Abdullah, do you risk missing God's message because you reject a gospel because there is uncertainty over a very small portion of it? Muhammad respected the gospel 600 years after Jesus. I respect it, don't get me wrong, and please don't take that Mills and Boone comment to think that, you know, I actually think that it's on par with that. I'm just trying to, you know, get you in the mode of what I think. Um, I, I do respect it. You know, for example, at home, I'll put it on the top shelf. You know, I won't read it partially clothed and, and stuff like that if I'm reading and actually preparing for a debate and so on. Um, so I do respect it and that's the same respect that the Prophet Muhammad gave it. But he also said to his companions, there is nothing for you there, you have something better. And the Quran says that as well and that's what I affirm. Uh, and in terms of uncertainty over a very small portion of it, well I think I illustrated that the portions of uncertainty are a little bit more than, than small. Uh, did Muhammad physically write the Qur'an all by himself or were there others who contributed to it? If you mean write literally, um, no, he didn't write it. Scribes wrote it down for him after he dictated it. If you mean write in terms of compose, no, only uh, he contributed to the Qur'an with the... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the fact. Well, I mean, we believe that God composed it, so it, ultimately it doesn't really matter how the revelation came down. We believe it comes from God, not from the Prophet. Abdullah, what do you say about the significance of Quranic abrogation? Were verses genuinely negated? And if so, does this mean the Quran was not perfectly preserved? Or does God Almighty have the right to alter his own revelation retrospectively? Well, the first point to understand is that there are different points of view about what Nasikh abrogation actually means. Okay, so the, you know, there, there's a saying, for example, in Arabic, Asham's uh, Nasikh Alayl, you know, that, that it, the sun abrogates, if you're going to translate it literally, the sun abrogates the night. Um, so when we talk about, for example, some verses that Samuel quoted, he quoted the various punishments for adultery. Now, the first point of this is that the first verse he quoted isn't exclusively for adultery, zina, it's for fashiha, okay, immodesty immorality. Okay, so the first verse that talks about people that commit immorality, fashiha, uh, being confined in their homes is universal. Then it becomes more, more specific. There's then a, a particular punishment for fornication, uh, and that's corporal punishment. And then there's a particular punishment adding on to that for adultery, which is when married people commit fornication. Um, so the thing is, it, it, it reveals more of itself. That's what I believe about abrogation. Now, there is a slightly different opinion within 
orthodox Islam as well, which is you know, permissible to take, but does it mean that it, it's not perfectly preserved? Absolutely not, because we retain all of that. And does it mean that uh, God has the right to alter his own revelation? Well, he has the right to reveal it in the way that he wants. And I would give that same right to any argument that Christians want to present about theirs, but obviously there needs to be some degree of rationality maintained in presenting that. What other ways was the Qur'an recorded and why weren't stone or sheepskin used, for example? Well, they were while the Prophet ﷺ was alive, and then after that, when they wanted to collect it into a single book, it was more practical to use papyrus and paper. How and when did the dots in the Arabic letters appear in the Qur'an? Uh, well, progressively over about three centuries, it's not just appearing in the Qur'an, it's actually appearing in Arabic writing itself as a system. Obviously, there were more books written in Arabic than just the Qur'an, uh, and not just books written by Muslims either, a lot of Arabic-speaking Christians. Why does God's word, the Qur'an, seem so complicated? The message of the Bible, slash Jesus, is clear and simple for all. Well, I disagree with both points. I think the message of the Qur'an is very simple. Believe in one God treat others as you'd like to be treated, you're going to get to go to heaven. That's pretty much it. Okay. Um, in terms of the message of the Bible slash Jesus, uh, I think the Christian scriptures are pretty convoluted. I think they match up in no way to the Hebrew scriptures, except for looking uh, retrospectively back at the Hebrew scriptures through the Christian scriptures. And an example would, you know, that I would say is that it's far easier for me to comprehend, I think for the average person to comprehend, that if I'm good, I'll be rewarded if God wants to. If I'm bad, I will be punished if God wants to. The Christian message is that someone else was punished for me and that, you know, doesn't, doesn't matter what I do. Now, obviously, I'm simplifying both messages there, but I would argue that the, the Christian message is the one that's convoluted and complicated. Why do Muslims nowadays riot and cause a lot of issues if a Quran is burnt when Uthman himself uh, was burning it? Well, I actually agree with this question. I find it bizarre because burning the Quran is actually one of the permissible ways to dispose of it. Um, with regards to the Qur'an and even the Christian scriptures, even though we don't believe that uh, it is completely um, true in, in what's contained within it now, um, we can only dispose of scriptures by burying them, uh, burning them, or uh, passing them into a, a passage of running water, like a running river. Uh, they're the only three ways. Can't throw it in the bin, you know, extremely um, disrespectful. Can't put it underneath a, you know, projector, extremely disrespectful, right? I'm not saying that Samuel did that, you know, I'm saying this, you know, this is our uh, jurisprudential view. Um, so in terms of burning it, I don't have a problem with it, you know, I mean, if people want to burn it, fine. One thing that I, you know, I wasn't happy with burning, there's a, there's a particular YouTube video where a guy burns it in between two pork chops um, on a barbecue. Um, now, does that deserve riots? Obviously not, you know, it deserves intellectual engagement and discussion and so on. Um, I can say wholeheartedly that I disagree with the breaking of any law of any country um, while we're in it. That's it. Uh, Quran says, when in doubt, refer to the Torah and gospel for final conclusion. Explain. Uh, well, we have to look at the verse that says this in context. And as I said, the explanation that I would give uh, is that it's referring to the pagan Arabs who had never heard of the concept of one God, who had never heard of the concept of revealed books and so on, to go and speak to the Christians and the Jews, and they'll then say, well, yes, we actually believe in these fundamental concepts. All right? Um, that's, that's my interpretation. If the Muslims maintain that the Bible is corrupt, does it mean that the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil are corrupt too? Therefore, Quran is also sick, corrupt. Um, basically... While we believe that the Torah was revealed, we believe that the Psalms were revealed, we believe that the Gospel was revealed, and we believe that what is in the modern-day Judeo-Christian scriptures today is somewhat reflective of this, we don't believe that they're the same thing. Okay? Um, you know, a comparison would be, say, like a 1960s XR Ford Falcon and, you know, a modern-day FG. You know, you can see they're same, you know, they come from Ford or whatever, but they're obviously not the, actual, the same thing. We don't believe that they're the same thing. Um, did they become corrupted in of themselves? Well, um, obviously, you know, and, and again, I've presented objective academic evidence for that. If the Quran is God's word, why are there satanic strips, uh, scriptures in the Quran? Well, there aren't, um, and the satanic verses is an apocryphal narration that's only included in uh, a single biographical uh, book that exists today, and even in that collection, it's referred to as being doubtful. Uh, Orthodox Islamic theology rejects the narration outright, so we don't believe that. Uh, 
Okay, I'm not even halfway through. Um, why are there hadiths, etc., in other books if the Quran is the Quran enough for a Muslim? Is it okay to read and follow on its own? Uh, well, certainly for a non-Muslim, don't busy yourself with uh, a hadith. Read the Quran first. Um, in terms of for us, well, we have jurisprudential rules, and the Quran itself says the best example for the believers is the Prophet. And how do we know the example of the Prophet through the certain a hadith? Uh, how do we know that the Prophet Muhammad's message is from God, or what proof is there that he is from God? Can you show us that the evidence that the Bible is corrupt? What is your proof? Uh, well, as for the second part of the question, that's sort of what most of my 20 minutes was about. Um, you'd have to prove to me, you know, something different about the gospel according to Mark, first of all, and then, you know, maybe we can go further into that question. How do I prove that the Prophet's message is from God? Well, ultimately, that's up to you to, to decide for yourself, as I said in the opening statements. Uh, that's probably it, so thank you very much. Sorry for all the people I didn't get through. And my friend, I gave you an extra 6.3 seconds that you recovered in cutting short an early bit. Well, we have heard very much tonight. It is time now for our friends to give their final word. They have 90 seconds to give their conclusion. Uh, I will not need to give any further introduction. Samuel first and then Abdullah. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming tonight in what may have been a difficult night for you. But again, I want to reiterate that it is important that we have these conversations, listen to each other and consider the evidence that we put forward. I've given you my notes there, so hopefully you can take those away and follow up what I've said. In summary for what I have said, I've said that the Bible is preserved and we can see that because it has a message that is the same throughout the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms, the Gospel, the same fundamental understanding of God and his work for us across a 1,500-year period in different cultures and in different languages. We considered the different manuscripts and how scholars examine these manuscripts from wide areas and can use them to identify any areas, errors that may have occurred. And so these can be taken into account. And this shows that the Bible has been well preserved. I also showed that the, uh, th that the claim by Muslim leaders that the, there's only one Quran is just not true. And I've actually presented tonight here several different Arabic versions of the Quran with over a thousand differences between them. Small differences, but differences nonetheless. I've get provided hadiths which show the nature of these verses to a greater extent. And again, I just call upon Muslim leaders to, to not exaggerate in this regard. I've also shown that the Bible and the Quran, that the, the Quran says not to make any distinction between the Bible. And so again, I encourage you to read the prophets and find out what God has done for you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you all for coming tonight, and I thoroughly appreciate the kindness of Christians all the time. Um, I'm always very impressed that I can say things like, uh, the Gospels are as reliable as Harry Potter uh, and get like maybe a couple scoffs or something from the audience, but that's kind of about it. Um, you're very good at not rioting. Uh, in terms of, um, and you know, I can make those jokes because I'm part of the club, right? Um, in terms of the Quran, it's very simple. As I said, the, main, the, the only objective that Samuel would have needed to fulfill tonight to prove me wrong is to give a single example of primary evidence a manuscript of the Quran, a single page that is different from what we have today. Uh, he failed in, in doing that. Uh, and that's not saying that he failed as a person. He's a wonderful man. He actually gave my son some presents when he was born, which we're very happy about. He's wearing one of them tonight. Um, the second point uh, is, again, very simple. There is no case for biblical inerrancy unless one is going to reject evidence and reject rationality. There is absolutely no case. We can then go on and then defeat other buzzwords, like saying that the Son of God is a consistent theme throughout the Judeo-Christian scriptures. It's not. The idea of the Son of God in the Hebrew Bible is completely different to the idea of the Son of God in the Christian scriptures. God has sons in Genesis that um, have intimate relations with the daughters of men. Um, you know, how, how does that work? The relationship is not the same. God is a triune God in the Christian scriptures, according to some interpretations. Absolutely not in the Hebrew. That was at the end. Thank you very much.